Hello community, last time we stopped here, looking here at the protoplanetary disk, where here new planets form here, where we had a look how artificial intelligence can use here visual transformer for object detection in protoplanetary disk. And today we go on. So what do we have? We have atoms. We have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and phosphorus. And they are extremely important if we look for organic life. Because, you know, our DNA, our desoxyribonucleic acid, is made out of four chemical bases. Adenine, tyrosine, guanine, and thymine, or derivative if you look for uh, RNA uracil. And you know that in the DNA, the sequence of the base pairs determine the genetic information that is stored in our DNA. Beautiful. Now, in April 2022, exactly one year ago, unbelievable, Nature published that all RNA and DNA base types are found in outer space, in meteorites that crashed down on our planet Earth and we collected in Antarctica. All RNA and DNA base types. So outside of our planet, those structures are in outer space. So if we have now a look here at our young star in the protoplanetary disk, and you see here a young planet is forming, cleaning up here his orbit in a Goldilocks zone. There's water, there's beauty, there's everything that we need. And there are our DNA and RNA bases. And this is amazing. How can they form in outer space? How can they be stable with harsh radiation from the sun? How is this possible without the shielding of the magnetosphere of Earth? Amazing questions, but we have them. And now I know what you're going to ask me. You're going to ask me, hey, what about the biochemistry now in our protoplanetary disk here around a young star? So glad that you ask, because you know how we store information. Now we have complete new possibilities. Remember machine code, PC, supercomputer center, we have everything in zero and one. We have binary structures. You have electricity or no electricity. Now here with organic chemistry, with our adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, we have three, we have four objects and those objects are three-dimensional. A zero is zero dimensional, or one is one dimensional, or I think a rather zero dimensional. And suddenly we have four objects in three dimension. So the possibilities of combination are almost astronomically. And if you look here at our DNA strand, you see here our base pair that you know, that you love from school, from university, wherever you were. So now, we talk about molecular machines today. So what I need is I need the genetic code information that is stored in the DNA sequence to get to the blueprints to build molecular machines within our human cells. Those molecular machines are complex assemblies of proteins that work together. You can have one protein, you can have five, you can have 10, you can have a huge amount of proteins that work together and form complex structures that perform specific functions within our cells. And of course, the most famous molecular machine that you know, at least from kindergarten, is adenosine triphosphate synthase. And here we use in this molecular machine the mechanical rotational force and we alter this force into a chemical reaction. So in the case of RTP, we have here the flow of protons through a specific enzyme, and this causes the enzyme to rotate, which in turn drives the synthesis of adenosine triphosphate from adenosine diphosphate and an inorganic phosphate. So this is a molecular machine you know so let's have a look again, just to make sure we're all on the same level. 
This is our cellular power plant. Here the energy for our cells is generated. This is our nuclear workhorse. And this is it. So where we are. We are deep inside a human cell. You see here, this carpet here is our inner mitochondrial membrane. And it divides here a region. We call this the intermembrane space where there's a high proton gradient to the matrix. This is the space outside where there are fewer protons. So we do have a gradient pushing outside. Now, the constituents are protons. And you remember what I told you about the short after the inflation of the universe, the hadronization phase, when we had the hot quark gluon plasma and confinement took place, and quark and gluons were confined within a proton and neutron hadronization phase. This here is our proton. And this is really, really an unbelievable small particle that drives the engine in our human cells. And to have this proton gradient over a membrane, we have four other molecular machines here. And you know them under the electron transport chain. One, two, three, four. They are protein, protein complexes that use electrons, so really elementary particles, leptons here, to pump protons back into the intermembrane space from the matrix so that we have here this gradient of proton so that our engine here can work and generate ATP. This is an unbelievable complex structure, but a beautiful video by Harvard University Online Look out for this video, electron transport chain, and here you find the YouTube link. Then you see this in 3D and it rotates, it moves. Unbelievable nice. So now we know, and now we have a look here at one molecular machine because we need to have the same understanding why we need artificial intelligence. So here you see here, the floor is our membrane and here in yellow, whatever this is, ochre, we have here our rotating, anti-clockwise rotating shaft. And this here generates a rotation energy that is here translated in a chemical reaction. This energy we need to come over a chemical threshold value and initiate a chemical reaction from adenosine diphosphate to adenosine triphosphate. And it happens here. And you see here this complex three-dimensional whatever structure you might call it. This is exactly our 3D folded protein structure. Because look, if you look a little bit inside, this is our 3D folded protein chain. You have the, the helix, you have your beta sheets. This is exactly done only for one reason. To have here the molecules in a configuration here in this space so that if ADP comes in, that it docks on multiple links to here our molecules. So then here we have here this cave, if you want, this molecular cave, so that we have here a good grip on ADP. All of this just to have a 3D configuration in our space. And then it is easy. Next up, so here we have ADP. This blue is what I just showed you, this folded complex protein structure. So this is here the cave walls, if you want. And here, what we want to achieve here is ADP. And here we have one phosphate. And we want, of course, both this phosphate together here into our green structure so that we go from diphosphate to triphosphate. When ATP is the fuel that we need, the energy that we need for all of our cells. But in order to have this chemical reaction, this blue mastermind matrix, whatever you want to call it, takes kinetic energy from the rotational shaft you see here, we are locked in, in here, our green structure. We locked in here, our pink structure, our pink phosphate. 
And then this whole protein, parts of it, ain't absorbing the kinetic energy of the shaft, starts to move a little bit. And this move, being fixed here and being fixed here, presses or bolts here this phosphate into ADP. So you see, suddenly we have now created what we are set out to create, ATP. It is a beautiful transformation of kinetic energy to chemical energy. And this is why we need this complex structure. And I know that you have now one question on your mind. How does the anticlockwise rotation of the shaft in the inner mitochondrial membrane, how does it happen? What drives, what energy force causes here the rotation? And as I told you, it is exactly here. We have a high proton density. Here in the matrix, we have a low proton density. So we have here channels. And one proton comes up here, comes up here, binds here, goes all the way around here, comes here, and here's another channel to go up and out. And it is not that it goes out, just that this causes the rotation. No, the rotation happens exactly before it leaves here on the output channel. The whole structure moves in its 3D shape to enable here a proton to leave its, its channel. And this drives here, gives us a little impulse, and this drives here this engine, if you want. It is an unbelievable molecular generator. If you haven't seen this before, have a look at the video. You will be amazed. So, now we understand the functions here of our F1, F0, ATP, synthase. We understand here our little protein complexes with our electron transport change that pump in here protons. So we have a proton gradient that makes our shaft create and makes our ADP to ATP. Beautiful. And now you might ask, okay, so if in the DNA, in this double helix structure with our hydrogen bond and so on, we encode here biological information in a structure, but where's the intelligence? Where's our central processing unit? It is wrong if you think like a machine. The intelligence is in the structure. We don't have somebody welding together the parts, creating a machine. The machine creates itself out of the data, out of the sequence of the protein sequence. And this is the amazing thing. Imagine you, you, you go on another planet and you just drop a box. And in this box, you just have genetic information and some molecular soup with all the ingredients that you need. Imagine you don't need to build something because there are some sequence inf information and they start to fold up, they start to build molecular machines. It is all in the data structure itself. And suddenly a little small mechanical machine comes out of the box and starts to, I don't know, produce oxygen. Unbelievable possibilities if you get here the 3D structure right. And again, all of this here, and just an easy example now, because we want to have here a molecule come in, more or less hold it in its position with here, here, a touch here, a touch here, a touch here. So it's really here fixed, and then we have a chemical reaction. So if you wonder why this, because you have to be absolutely precise, because you're working here on a molecular or an atomic level of precision. If you want to learn more about molecular biology, this is a free book by National Library of Medicine, a US state government, blah, blah, blah. Unbelievable, informative, nice, go there. You learn a lot. Here is the HTTPS link, great information. So you see proteins, consist of other proteins, they form more complex protein complexes. You have rotational energy, thermal energy, you have different chemical interfaces. It is unbelievable what we can build with four bases 
and just three-dimensional structure. And the three-dimensional structure is exactly where we will apply artificial intelligence on. So, oh yeah. Remember in the last video, I told you about the origin of the universe. This is exactly now the next two slides. We start from the very beginning. We have DNA, we have section in the DNA we call genes. Those genes, those code sequences contain the instruction for making proteins. Those are our blueprints that I need. When you switch on a gene, an enzyme called RNA polymerase attaches to the very beginning of this gene and it moves along the DNA and it makes a strand of messenger RNA out of the free bases in the nucleus. Remember, I told you, this is a dense molecular soup of all the ingredients. This is really dense fluid soup and it is so easy to bring in the ingredients you need to have here messenger RNA transcription phase. Oh, the DNA code determines in order in which the free bases are added to the messenger RNA. We have this transcription, we clean it up a little bit, you know this, and then it's time to move out. We are now adults, we move out from home, so the messenger RNA moves out of the nucleus in the cell into the cytoplasm of the cell. And over there, we have some beautiful objects called ribosomes. They are our protein factories where proteins are created in the cytoplasm. So they bind to the messenger RNA. The ribosome read the code in the messenger RNA to produce a chain, a linear chain made up of 20 amino acids. This is here our linear structure of proteins. Whenever we'll talk about the linear structure of proteins, here they are created. So then you have transfer RNA molecules carrying out the amino acids to the ribosome. And this messenger RNA is read three bases at a time. So imagine on the bottom of this thing, you have three bases. They attach here. And on the top, you have one amino acid. And so you build here, based on the coding of the basis, the chain of amino acids. As each triplet is read, a transfer RNA delivers the corresponding amino acid, as I told you on the top. It is added to a growing chain of amino acid. And once the last amino acid has been added to this long chain, the chain starts to fold into a complex 3D shape to form the protein. And this is here where we have AI. So you go for a linear structure, a highly complex linear structure with a lot of alterations into a 3D shape of this protein. And now you say, how does this protein know that it has to fold in a certain way in three dimension? What is the goal? And it is easy. In nature, you want to have a stable position that you do not decay any further, that you do not fold any further. You want to be at the bottom of the energy level if you want. And this here is the most energetically favorable state of the molecules. Now you have a lot of different interaction forces. You have chemical forces like the hydrophobic interaction. The most important are the hydrogen bond. You have ionic bonds. You have this very old van der Waals forces, you have diesel feed bonds, you have a lot of chemical bonds going on, attracting, repulsive, and in all of this beauty of 3D pure chaos, the molecule finds its final folded shape, and it's more or less a miracle to me. So the folded shape of a protein is important because it determines the function of the molecule. The protein has specific binding sites or active sites that are only properly formed when the protein is in its correct folded shape. I told you, to, to grab onto this little molecule structure, you have to have the perfect 3D folded shape so that you have a link on multiple legs. Great. Yeah. So if you have this complex, you have no glue, you have no nails, you have no bolts, you have no hammer, nothing. You just have chemical forces, attractive, repulsive, working on molecular level. You have all here your possible molecular configurations. 
and the carbuncle forces act finally to find here the specific molecule complex in 3D. This is really a miracle of life. So, yes, molecular machines are 3D folded proteins, do most of the work. Our DNA has 20,000 blueprints for making specific proteins. And each DNA sequence contains instructions to make a protein. It's known as a gene, I told you. Now, the size of a gene is greatly varying from 1,000 bases to over 1 million bases in humans. And the interesting fact is that the genes, those sequences, make only up 1% of the whole DNA sequence length. So, what about another 99%? Another video. And now, artificial intelligence. Those 3D shape of proteins can be predicted using AI tools, such as AlphaFold 2. Maybe you've heard AlphaFold DeepMind Google. Beautiful. Here we are. Yes, now I want to introduce you to an unbelievable woman, Polly Fordyce. Professor of Genetics, Bioengineering, Stanford University, the principal investigator of her own lab. And she has one question. How does a protein linear sequence, you remember at the beginning when it's a linear sequence, alters its 3D structure and its biomolecular function? If you, on this linear sequence, you exchange position 3812, with position 3813. If you just mix up two, what happens to its 3D structure? What happens to its biomolecular function? And the permutation manifold is astronomically. And this is the reason why she or her lab developed microfluidic devices that allows us to do science on fluid computation in a high throughput. Let's have a look at this. Yeah, before, the different chemical forces, hydrophobic interaction, the hydrogen bonds, the ionic bonds, the Waltz force, the disulfide bonds, peptide bonds, you have a whole complexity going on. But of course, those are only chemical forces. And you know, this is because the chemist, chemical people did not talk to the people in the physics department because the real forces are the one that physics cares about. So all those chemical forces we know in physics, but we have complete different explanation. In physics, we talk about quantum field theory, when here in chemistry, you talk about the interaction of molecules based on the exchange of something. So chemical and physical views might differ, but at the end, it is the quantum field theory that explains here all the chemical forces. In physics, you find different wordings like virtual photons. Remember Feynman diagrams, exactly this is what comes into place here. So this here is a physical interpretation of the force. And this here is a chemical interpretation of some professor of chemistry. So you see, you can read, but it is more or less the same physical force. Beautiful. Coming back for this lab, here you have an array, a fluid array, you have 1,500 chambers and you can do high throughput. You look at this with an optical device and you see exactly where some reaction is happening if you have some photofluorescence molecule attached to it. Unbelievable, intelligent, multiplexing, array-based fluid, microfluid arrays. And here the next step. This here is a bubble a fluid bubble that has a content of one nanoliter. Unbelievable small. But she can produce, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000, maybe a million bubbles. And you see, in every bubble, you can have a different permutation of the linear chain of the protein sequence. And then you let it fold. And if it folds in a specific way that it does a function or becomes a machine or whatever, you can attach here a specific indicator, a marker, and then this marker lights up. So you see, you look here at, I don't know, 500 bubbles, and you see exactly one, two, three, four bubbles have something that we can use. So you go there, you examine in detail, 
So you have a, a, a high throughput, you have your standard flow, cytometers, and, 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 but very nice. And she wants to make this open source. She has an own GitHub. You can look here at the AI code. You can look here at the machine. She invites everybody to come run the experiments. She's developing now, I think, with close to a million micro nano bubbles. Amazing work is going on. Yeah, so we have all this AI models, this in silico experiments. You can do billions of in silico experiments, and the one with the highest chance of success. You pick the top thousand experiments, you go into experimental technique. Such an array has the minimum array has 1,500 chambers. So you can do some high throughput verification. Yes, 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 yes. Those are her words. But you know what's really interesting? Look, she is even thinking beyond this because she says, hey, what if we can design enzymes with some particular function, but that work outside of the human body? So she says, hey, well, what about you have an accident and you have toxic chemicals are leaking out in the environment? How are we going to clean this up? And she says, if we can program here our protein folding structure and we know exactly what we want and we know how we have a linear encoding in the linear sequence of the protein, we can build our molecular machine for a specific task. So she says, make example, a protein that would have the capability of breaking down the toxic compound in non-toxic components. So you just go there, spray from the helicopter, the enzyme over the toxic, whatever happens, and the whole stuff becomes non-toxic. Unbelievable, precise medicine that will await us in the next years. So if you are interested in artificial intelligence, and you want to work here in bioengineering or astrobioengineering if you go outside of this of planet Earth. AI has an immense potential to contribute to the science here. Her work is what she calls the ground truth. Because she makes thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousand, millions of observations in her experiments. And those experiments are the training data for our AI for AlphaFold 2. Without her experiments, we would have no training data to train our AI system. And if you hear in the background a little bird, <laughs> yeah, that's him. So you see, she is creating the training data set for our bioengineering AI. And it is this is where AI is happening, where AI is contributing massively. And we need a lot of new researcher over there. So here you can make significant contributions. You can design new drugs, new medicine to fight cancer, multiple other diseases. You have individual medicine, precise medicine, specific for your cells, for your cell type. You can design those molecular machines, but you have to have training data set for the AI. And this is her work and she calls this ground truth. And let me let me be a little bit provocative and I just heard another truth and it was called total truth by a billionaire in the US. And he builds up his AI system now. And he says this will be his AI system to communicate the truth to the social media. Remember this guy with his $8 blue certification badge right next to your name? He calls his AI the total truth. And she is doing really the groundwork and calls her, her work the ground truth. But she really lays down the foundation that we have AI systems that allow us to design new medical compounds, to design new proteins, new molecular machines inside the human cell or outside. So you see, sometimes I see this guy 10 times in my social media, but I think you should, you should know her at least in one video that you have seen. If you want to go there, AlphaFold has a protein structure database developed by DeepMind, Google, with some European organization. 
you enter the name of the protein that you're looking for and you get the protein structure all the proteins that we know are there so what we know is in this beautiful database but of course DeepMind is also very active in research they have excellent publication if you want to learn more on this specific topic and I have here a publication from February, I think 2023, and you see here in JAX. And of course, they do their work here in JAX. And I thought, this is a beautiful interrupt that maybe it is time now that we start here that JAX will become our third framework for AI after TensorFlow 2 and after PyTorch 2. JAX for distributed computing. If you had eight, eight GPUs or 256 GPUs, JAX is another leak. JAX is completely optimized for distributed system. It has some gradient mechanisms I want to show you in my next video. So it is time now to go professionally. Have a look at JAX. And this will be the topic of one of my next video. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. There was something informative, some new information, some new insights for you. I'd like to share my knowledge. If you like it, I see you in my next video.